Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Chelsea Lake. I'm a member of the events team at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you to PMP Live. Thank you for joining us in this virtual format in which we strive to bring you the authors we all love to our politics and prose community. We would like to thank our friends at the Washington Literacy Center for co-sponsoring the event tonight. Washington Literacy Center has been helping DC residents with the greatest barriers and fewest resources learn to read since 1963. And we're so glad to have them as our partners. The WLC knows that new immigrants are a crucial component to many restaurants and their success. With their novel methods for teaching ESL to immigrants who struggle to read in their native languages, WLC is looking to work with DC area restaurants and their staff who may need support in improving their literacy skills. I will be dropping a link in the chat where you can learn more about this organization and also make a donation if you are able. We're also very grateful to Jose I like it. Think mm -hmm. Food Group, specifically the Tina's concept chef, who will be joining us in just a, a moment. Uh, for their wonderful contribution to this event. Before we get started, uh, can ask, uh, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions, but we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. We are delighted to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To access captions, click on the live transcript also at the bottom of your screen. Finally, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Yasmin Khan is a food and travel writer, broadcaster, and human rights campaigner based in London. She is the author of two cookbooks, The Saffron Tales and Zaytun. Khan will be in conversation with Nathan Thornburg, a co-founder, publisher at Roads and Kingdoms who spent nearly a decade working at Time Magazine as a foreign correspondent and editor. And it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Chef Michael Costa. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm here to uh, talk about the food a little bit. Um, the uh, bag that you receive will have a, a large black box. Uh, if it looks a little bit like a Japanese bento box, that's not entirely a coincidence. We, we just wanted to fill it with meze instead of the things you might normally find. Uh, in there, you will find the grape leaves uh, with some strained yogurt next to them, the garlicky eggplant spread, the muhamara, the sweet potato chickpea and tahini salad, as well as the shepherd salad. Nothing needs to be done to those. You can just eat those straight away like they are. Uh, they're ready to go. The uh, hot portion of the meal, the swordfish kebabs and the kudu kofte are both sitting on a little bit of the orzo rice. If you want to warm those, my suggestion would be about a tablespoon of water add, put the lid back on and microwave them, believe it or not, for, for a minute. And that should be all you need to, to create a little bit of steam just to knock the, uh, get, get a little bit of heat going there. Uh, everything else is uh, ideal at room temperature or even a little bit cold. Uh, we put a couple of surprise treats in there that weren't on the printed menu. Uh, we um, made some Turkish bread from page 72 and we included the cucumber yogurt with mint and the pickled red cabbage uh, to accompany uh, the kuru kofte because just because they're they're so good with it uh and then in a separate box the uh bugatsa and the date and walnut brownies uh can be eaten room temperature uh my suggestion i mean if you like your brownies warm i certainly do uh same trick you know 30 seconds in the microwave will will do them wonders if you want to warm any of that in a conventional oven the container that it came in um the, for the swordfish and the kebabs, those can be put in the oven if you uh, cover with aluminum foil. The plastic lid definitely won't perform well in the oven, but the other pieces uh, will. But again, my, my suggestion is if you have a microwave, just do that. That's gonna give you the most uh, consistent result. So um, there it is. So I guess I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Nathan and Yasmin. Awesome, thank you so much, Chef Costa. I am... Uh, Sorry that I'm so many hundreds of miles from you down in D.C. and I don't get to take part in any of that. So if you've gotten your meal from Zaitinia, consider yourselves lucky. I've eaten there before. It's uh, it's an amazing thing. And I think it's I don't know. I kind of love the idea of starting this hour 
with Yasmin in, in a sort of granular food space, right? Where we're like talking about how to heat things up, what the side dishes are, why the chef has chosen to feed you these things. Because, you know, I think of all the ways that Yasmin could talk about the world and could talk about these parts of the world in particular that she's continually drawn to, uh, parts of the world in conflict. I think choosing food to do it is, uh, is radical, revolutionary. And uh, part of why I'm such a huge fan of her and of this book. So let's start there. Yasmin, you are talking about uh, a migration crisis. You're talking about countries in conflict. Why food? Why food? Well, I mean, for me, as someone who um, comes from a human rights background, you know, I was an activist, uh, worked for nonprofits for many years. A lot of my life has been about telling stories. And what I really found when I was doing that kind of work is that, you know, if you're trying to convince someone that we need to change a law and prosecute police officers, or if you're trying to convince someone that maybe people in Gaza don't deserve to live under a terrible blockade, the first thing you have to do is build some kind of connection between like you sat in like uh, an apartment in Queens and a stranger sat in, you know, an apartment in Gaza City. And for me, food just is such an obvious point of connection, you know, between all of us, wherever we are. I mean, I'm in London and my mouth was salivating listening to that menu. And it isn't just because it was inspired by my book. It was because, you know, you want to be at that table. You want to be eating that food. We want to be all doing it together. So for me, food's just a great connector. You know, another tie in with Jose Andres and obviously Think Food Group, the work that Jose does with World Central Kitchen is a, you know, I think one of the things that was very novel uh, and kind of innovative for for that organization was to consider the power of home cooked meals in particular. Um, and that is a theme that comes up again and again uh, throughout Ripe Figs is this kind of power of preparation, uh, power of something crafted just for the people who are being served. Can you Tell me one example from your travels for this book where you saw saw that dynamic in in uh, in action. Sure, um, I so for those who don't know, just a bit of background. Like my USB maybe is that like I travel around cooking in people's kitchens, and you know I'm a home cook, not professionally trained, but you know like many. British greats like Nigella and Nigel Slater. We, you know, us Brits, we, we embrace the home cook quite a lot, I think. Um, but what I was doing in this book was obviously traveling around the Eastern Mediterranean and often talking to people involved really at the front lines of showing solidarity with the refugee. Um, I'm pulling back from using the word crisis these days, but from the, you know, massive, you know, um, movement of people through the region. Um, and there's there's probably like two examples. I know you asked for one, but I'm going to give you two. I'm going to give you extra value for your question. Um, oh, <laughs> is that there's this great women's run um, nonprofit in in Athens, and one of the things they did was this thing called Breakfast in the Park, and that was an initiative where members of the of the of the organisation would create. Would, would pack together little breakfast dish it, packs, like little um, like lunch boxes, but for breakfast, you know what I mean? To take to the park. And the whole point was that that would always be, it couldn't just be like, let's order in like mass catering. It would be something that somebody in the organization had made for another person. And the reason for that was, and I think this comes back to the power of food, is like, we all know, like there's a particular, emotional exchange that takes place when someone cooks for you in their home and they give you that food. Um, there is an exchange, not just of raw ingredients, but of sentiment, right? Of the sentiment of, I care for you. I'm making the time and I'm making the effort. Like you're worthy of me doing that. So you get this whole, whole exchange. Um, so that was one story. And then the other one, which I think you know, and I've been very fortunate to travel the world, you know, interviewing a lot of people over my life, but this was probably one of the most moving stories I've heard. And it was in Lesbos where there was a couple, Nikos and Katerina, he was a fisherman. She ran the fish restaurant. And uh, one day, he, this is like about five years ago, he was just out at night with the fishing boats and he saw this boat come in with a lot of people who didn't look Greek, you know, they're wearing hijabs. And, you know, he was like, you all okay? What are you doing on this boat at night? And they said, we're, we're, we've, we've come from Syria, we're fleeing the war. 
And I mean, he's kind of jaw dropped and he's like, right, okay, come to shore, let me help. And he, you know, got them blankets, went home, got them food. Long story short, this, this couple were so moved by the constant influx of refugees and migrants, they decided to change their restaurant and turn it into a space where they would offer free meals, turn it into a nonprofit and get funding for that, where they would serve free meals to people in the nearby camps every day, but not free meals like here's a bit of plastic, you know, top, you know, container. They would set linen tablecloths with proper cutlery, proper glassware. And the whole idea was to kind of offer people a semblance of dignity at a time when people had lost so much. And I was so moved by that story because it was, yeah, you, you see people there, you know, living in really difficult conditions in tents, you know, having lost everything. And yet to be able to sit at a table and to be yeah. invited to someone's table, that was really something. You know, I think particularly in these times of tremendous need, I mean, even just going around Queens today, I passed at least three or four lines of people kind of lined up for pantries and, and food. Uh, you know, it's always an incredible reminder of the kind of help that, that really makes a difference. I was in Katrina uh, or in New Orleans after Katrina, and they were handing out MREs. And they might as well have shot these meals out of a gun at people. I mean, it was the loneliest kind of least loving food experience maybe I've ever seen. And that's, you know, I, I feel like for everybody on this call, if you have a choice of places to donate, to support in this time, look for the ones that are doing that. Those little touches, like the linen tablecloth, the people, it's not just about the experience, but it's also kind of recognizing the humanity of people whose humanity has been denied, right? So nice. intensely. Um, so you had mentioned being able to travel around and, and kind of the, the way that you uh, have, have been able to go to these different parts of the world. It's always still a wonder to me that moment where you cross the threshold into, uh, into a kitchen that's been you know, staffed by migrants who've just made this harrowing journey. And there you come as an outsider, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a British citizen, as someone who is there by choice. What, in, in your mind, what is the first thing you need to do to kind of set that relationship to, to get you to the point that you are at the end when you're telling their stories in this book of, of the closeness that you have? It's a really good question. And while I was there, um, actually over the month, you know, I kind of went back and forth so many times, I saw kind of other reporters come in as well. And it was really interesting just to observe the different way in which people do this. So I... You know, I, I am British for sure, uh, 100%. Um, but of course, you know, I also have a heritage that was very close to many of the people that I was speaking to. I mean, I write about this in the book and I don't feel like it's talked about enough. And there's like, a, it's like a whole separate tangent. But I mean, camps <laughs> on Europe's borders, certainly in the Eastern Mediterranean, is a very particular ethnicity that is getting, you know, placed in these in these camps. You know, I would say that 95% of the people there were of Muslim background. Um, you know, it's remnants of the war on Iraq, on Afghanistan, it's Syrians, it's Palestinians, it's Iranians, it's um, people from Yemen. So that in and of itself was quite an interesting thing to observe because I was just like, whoa, like it, when you see it, it's when you see it, it's just like, okay, would this be happening if this was, you know, white Christians, I mean, it's a separate debate. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is that there was some rapport that I could definitely, I start with, which is just the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm a very fortunate second generation migrant. I mean, my parents were economic migrants, but other family members of mine have been political um, refugees. You know, they've been, I've got family members who've paid people smugglers to, you know, carry them over the hills of Turkey. I've got an aunt in the UK who was a political refugee who, you know, probably would have ended up in jail, if not worse, if she'd not been able to get out. So I guess, um, you know, the stories in this book and the stories of the people I met, they, they felt very personal to me because they really could have been any one of members of any one of kind of the members of my family. But I have a particular rule with these kind of interviews in that I never ask people why they left and I never actually ask people about the specifics of their journey unless they offer it up to me. That's because I think it's, there's this really fine line when you're doing this kind of reporting and not making people relive their trauma for you to get some story. And actually it didn't really matter to me why, they were le why they'd left wherever they'd left. And it didn't really matter to, well, not matter, obviously, you know, I care, but I just think 
I'm really conscious of just not going in there with that. It's more like, hey, I'd love to talk to you about the food because like, this is what I do. I try and, you know, connect people through food. And I think like, you know, our, this bit of the world gets demonized. And I just go straight into that. And, um, and then people tend to relax. And I guess then the rules of reporting kind of switch a bit. And once people are relaxed and you're chopping onions, then, you know, people start sharing if they want to. Yeah. I mean, it's a very appealing kind of journalism because it's almost the opposite. You'd mentioned other journalists kind of coming in, having having been a member of that tribe. That is sort of the opposite. I mean, you're looking for the worst story, you know, yeah. uh, you're looking for the most intense. And maybe the goal is the same. Right. You want to be able to tell something that will get people to feel something. But uh, I think this form of meeting people in the moment they're in and not the one they've just come through is is um well, it's it's humanizing, uh, as you put it. Um, you would said that you do not like this word crisis, yeah. uh, which I'm gonna I'm gonna have to catch myself because it is it, it's almost like uh, you know exhaling. It's like a natural thing to say. We've got a migrant crisis in the Mediterranean, but tell me tell me about that. What what is what is it about that word? What's actually the situation if not uh, a crisis? So I've gone on a journey myself whilst writing this book. I mean, the book proposal pitch definitely had crisis in the Mediterranean in it. But through the years that I've spent now researching migration seen through the microcosm of Greece, Turkey and Cyprus, I think there's something much bigger going on that perhaps the word crisis doesn't really help us to understand. Because to say that there's a refugee crisis is to suggest that throughout human history, people haven't always moved all the time for their survival and out of necessity, you know? Um, migration is just simply what it means, what is part of what it means to exist as this species on this planet. And we're not just this species, actually, other animals do it too. And uh, if you, <laughs> I'm gonna get quite theoretical, so stay with me. If you think about the fact that nation states are very modern constructs, right? We're looking at a few hundred years. Before that, we had empires. Before that, we didn't even have rules that said, you're an alien, you're not allowed to come in. People just moved. And I guess, the big question that I'd like people to start thinking about, or I'd hope, you know, the book inspires, is that if humans have always moved, and again, it just we just need to look at history of the, every decade some people are moving. If they've always done that, then it's not a crisis. It's just part of what we do as a species. And therefore it doesn't need these um, really brutal political responses that politicians on both sides of the Atlantic are now doing, you know, basically making migrants and refugees, the perpetual scapegoat for all of society's ills. And like, we have to build a fence, we have to build a wall, we have to leave the EU, we have to do all of these things because we've got to stop migration. It's just not gonna happen. So I'm trying to move away from using the word crisis and just saying, hey, migration is what we do as a species. How are we gonna update our concept of borders in order to deal with the mass climate migration we're gonna get in the next century? Right. Yeah, that, I, I took it everywhere. <laughs> right, that one extra little note of like, listen guys, you are so smug behind your wall, but your turn is coming. And in fact, you know, if you kind of zoom out, our turn is already here. I mean, this is this is happening uh, within our borders as well. So uh, welcome, welcome to the club. Uh, I, you know, I'd read a lot of different uh, appreciations, reviews, Q and A's about ripe figs uh, going in here. I was kind of struck by one that Rushta Rafiq had written in the New Arab. Um, she had this interesting way of kind of following on and to what you were saying, which was saying that that essentially this, you know, this migration moment that we're in is actually collapsing culinary borders um, between the different parts of the Mediterranean that you include in this book. And I kind of want I, I, I want to use that to pivot a little bit because I think that big umbrella of this book, which is different than, you know, the Saffron Tales, which was, you know, all Iran, which is different than Zaytun, which is uh, all Palestine, essentially. And and I think that it's it's kind of fascinating to include these different countries under one cuisine. So tell me, I mean, how would you define the food in this book? What What is that cuisine? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, just from a creative point of view, it was just really fun for me as well, just to be able to zoom out in that way and look for the similarities where, again, political leaders would probably like us to see difference. So the food of this region is united around, um, you know, 
the use of lots of fragrant herbs such as oregano and dill and mint to flavor everything from like roasted meat dishes to beautiful vegetable stews. It's a region where the olive oil flows in abundance. It's a region which has like a special affinity for grilling meat over barbecue, over, over hot coals um, at, with, you know, I mean, the Turks are definitely the king of kebabs, but the, the, the Cypriots and the Greeks, you know, are not far behind. Um, it's a region where um, I think, yeah, you know, meze obviously is, is you know, is, is part of the intrinsic pattern of, of, of the culinary tradition there. But I, by meze, I don't just mean like the specific dishes like the tarama or the, you know, um, yeah, the, the kind of aubergine dishes or the, or, the, or the salad. I'm talking about meze as a way of eating, which is, hey, we all sit around a table. Mm. We sit around it for hours. We have a bottle of raki or um, what's the or uzo, the, the equivalent, and we just talk, you know. And 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 so there is, as well as like the ingredients that are similar, there's also a culture of eating that's similar because you know the borders of that region are, are as fluid as they've been contested over like right. several thousand millennia, you know. Yeah, I mean, to to my mind, that that's one of the things that makes the recipes and the kind of the, the food focus of this book so consonant with the stories that you get in between there is because they're both saying the same damn thing, right? It's like one people, you know, one region, one cuisine in a way. Uh, did you, that being said, uh, you know, you're no stranger to conflicts in, in these books that you put together. I mean, obviously Iran is in a context of conflict with its neighbors, with the Saffron Tales, you know, stay tuned. There's enough conflict for every one, for all of us in Palestine. Uh, these countries are in conflict often with each other. Did you, <laughs> did you have to step gently? I noticed you have some Turkish, you know, it's not just Aleppo pepper, but it's, uh, you know, uh, putting the Turkish phrase and then pull beaver in, you know, like you're trying to um, give everybody their moment. How, how did you navigate that? And did you find it difficult? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm already kicking myself slightly for not using the word halim as often as I use the word halloumi, for example. And I'm just like, I just use the Greek word all the way through. And, you know, so yeah, I try and use them interchangeably. Like, okay, it's, it's dolma here. And then it's, you know, the, the um, sama, you know, here. So yeah, it was, it was a, a delicate line. But then also, I guess, the whole point of the book is it's a medley of, 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 of flavors that represent the totality of the region. So I, um, the, the fact that, that, yeah, sometimes it was all interchangeable in terms of the culinary terms, I felt just also added to the, just the ethos of the book. But yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, I think Cyprus was probably where that was felt the most starkly, just because, well, you know what it's like, at the end of the day, as a, as a writer, you, you tend to approach people with a particular viewpoint before you even met them, you know who you're approaching. Like I wasn't approaching many, you know, I don't know, Greek nationalists or, you know, Erdogan supporters. Um, uh, and then on uh, church cookbook. Exactly. Yeah, okay. But, you know, in Cyprus, um, even amongst kind of a lot of the right on people that I was meeting, you know, because of the, for people who don't know, Cyprus is an, an island that's divided. Um, Turkish in the Turkish Cypriot in the north, Greek Cypriot in the south, UN border and green zone in the middle. Um, it's been divided about 30 years, remnants of British colonialism. You can read the book for the full story. Um, but there, yeah, there it was difficult, you know, it's that thing that I'm sure you've had it, you know, when you're sitting sharing a meal with someone who's expressing some views that, I mean, they're racist, you're definitely uncomfortable. And then you're it's, like, what? Yeah, it's called Thanksgiving here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know yeah. what you're talking about. But yeah, it's it's difficult. And the definitely, for, I, I did, unfortunately, you know, come across that a lot with the Greek Cypriot side around like, you know, this particular woman who was so nice to me, but then was just like, yeah, I always take my own food when I go over the other side of the border because I wouldn't want to <laughs> eat their food. And I was like, what? What? I thought I misunderstood. And then she's like, and I wouldn't want to give money to that economy. And I was just like, okay, oh God, okay. <laughs> yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So right. yeah how am I going to, you know, revive you in my mind as the woman that I had hoped that you would be? Yeah. Uh, yeah that, I mean, she stopped commenting on my Instagram since the book's come out. So I don't know if she's read that <laughs> section, but like, I tried to yeah. be as polite as I could, but it was. Um, 
yeah, the many, many faceted uh, nature of human beings can uh, really complicate a narrative uh, at, yeah. at an opportune time. Um, but it's, you know, that's an interesting point to me because another thing that I think really characterizes uh, your writing and why I find it absolutely um, spot on with my own experiences throughout the world, and I think a lot of readers connect with it, is this idea, I mean, listen, we just talked about food as a great connector, but sometimes, you know, an asshole cooks a great meal, you know, <laughs> sometimes these, I'm not calling this woman, I, I wasn't there, but you know, this, this, there are limits to the perfection of these ideas that we have, and one of the things you do so well is kind of show the limits of the perfection of, of travel and culinary travel uh, more specifically. Um, you know, talk about, about those moments in the book where you're just sort of saying like, okay, this is not, you know, this is not the Instagram travel that you may have thought you came here for. Yeah. So, um, so this, this wasn't an, I mean, writing a book is never easy but this was a particularly challenging time period in my life while this book was was coming together and there's a an opening section where I'm in Athens and yeah I just start describing because you know I was going through a tough time how difficult I found it to be there you know there's this cliche I almost feel like sometimes I want to vomit when I see like some travel rights travel food and travel people on Instagram and it's all just like this like super like happy old teeth, you know, in front of a market stall, like eating an orange, like they're just having like the best time ever. And travel isn't always like that. You know, travel is hard and it's tiring. And sometimes like you have really bad meals and like the hotel you're in is like awful. And, you know, like it, you just, some days you just, I just think there's this real sense that I, I try and get across in all my writing that I try and sum up the whole of the human experience, you know, whether that's joyful or sad or difficult. Um, and yeah, I mean, in that particular, we can segue into it, but like, you know, the, the title of the book, Ripe Fix, um, quite an evocative title, but it, in, and it, it sums up a lot of the beauty, I think, in the region and it sums up the, and it's uh, an emblem, I think, that you find all throughout the region. Um, but, you know, the actual story for that was that, you know, I was in Athens. I'd um, I'd recently had a miscarriage uh, just before I went there, just before I started the research trip. And therefore, I was just feeling so exhausted and really not in the right headspace to, to do interviews. And so one morning I was just sat. Uh, uh, on the balcony. It was in Exakia, this kind of real punk anarchist area, um, staring out at the graffiti and the sun coming up and the sun bleached awnings kind of overlooking all the buildings. And I was eating this punnet of figs that I'd bought down at this market the day before. And the figs were really sweet. And, um, you know, they tasted like honey and treacle. And as I was eating them, feeling like super stressed about my work, I just started thinking, oh, those figs, they're so lovely. And they reminded me of my grandparents uh, who had a farm in Northern Iran, which had two fig trees. Um, and it reminded me of my grandmother who'd always know which fig to pick. And my grandfather who would always collect all the figs and bring us them for breakfast. And yeah, um, you know, the title of the book comes from that, a sad experience, but where just the very fact of eating figs made me feel connected. It made me feel my community. It made me think of my family and it made me feel safe. And that's sometimes the power of food, isn't it? That even in the most challenging of circumstances, it can make us feel that we're at home. Um, I, you know, as I'm not sure if this is a response as, as someone who's known you for a long time that loves and admires you, but I, I remember going through and reading that first chapter and I just wrote, damn, in my notes, you know, like <laughs> it, it uh, and if, this is not in the book, but if any of you uh, listening have a chance to read the piece that Yasmin wrote uh, in Vogue, which talks about um, about that episode and and also kind of her ongoing, uh, you know, grief really about uh, this process of miscarrying. And it's just um, it's as I felt very bad recognizing it's beautiful writing. <laughs> uh, and then it's also very, you know, it, it for me who, who uh, you know, reading through it was, was really affecting and moving. I, I did wonder, you know, because this is right at the beginning of the book and you're just stepping into these conversations and these journeys with people who are having very difficult life circumstances and you had never felt so vulnerable to me as a reader 
Um, was that part of the experience? I mean, what is it like not going in there as the award-winning author of multiple books who's got a contract with a major publisher to create this, what is a gorgeous tome, but as someone going through this very personal, difficult process, did it change the way that that experience was for you? I think it probably definitely changed the book. You know, I don't think you can have those experiences that I had in my personal life whilst also traveling. Um, and, and not, I think that how it changed my interactions with people is that it probably, yeah, it probably made me more acutely aware of their loss and it probably made them, it probably leveled me down as someone who, yeah, was also going through loss. I mean, you know, it, people of that, um, you know, from, from that part of the world are always asking you if, you, if you've got kids. And, and of course I kept saying I didn't, or, you know, a few times I was pregnant, you know, I, in both of the times that I was in Cyprus for the book, I was pregnant. There's a lot of pictures of me being pregnant in the book. It's very like, it was a whole thing after we finished, after this whole episode where I was like, do, can we put these pictures in? Do we go back and reshoot? What do we do? Can I do this? And in the end, you know, it is a book about migration. It's a book about incredible food, but it's also a book about, you know, the vulnerabilities that so many people face. And I guess in a way, and I mean, who, who'd have thought this would happen when I, you know, wrote the book pitch in a way, my vulnerabilities were also part of that. And, and why not, you know, like I've, I guess, yeah, I, I turned 40 recently. So in my old age, I can tell you that I've suddenly realized that it's just really liberating to just be very honest about how one is all the time. That doesn't mean you have to vomit out your life story, but there is something quite good about being able to say, yeah, this was a tough time, but it, you know, it's still a great book and the recipes are still banging. <laughs> um, or or all, the, all the more so, right? I mean, it's, I, it's funny because I definitely read this book in a time of pandemic as something that spoke to that, like that interplay between personal loss, frustration, struggle, and global, you know, global feelings is I think something that has visited all of us in the last year, wasn't your plan, but it just, it spoke to me so strongly uh, because of that in, in particular. Um, all right, so uh, speaking of this year, I moved to Astoria, Queens, which is a, a largely Greek neighborhood where I think I was, Telling a friend of mine, if I stuck a bowl out, you know, of a window, it would come back filled with tzatziki. It's like you know, <laughs> we're, we're swimming in it here, which is a great thing. Um, but even I had to do some serious upgrades to my pantry just reading through this book. You know, yes. as for someone who is not from these cultures, uh, give me a few of those key things that they've got to go and have in order to kind of replicate these flavors uh, and these recipes in the book. Yeah. So thankfully there aren't many, but I think there's probably like five or six things that if you go out and get them, you'll be able to replicate everything in this book and your life will just be better infinitely for it. So I'm gonna start with the thing that I'm probably known for, the old classic, pomegranate molasses. Uh, one day a pomegranate company will sponsor me. I don't know if that is a thing, but I'm just putting it out there, DC and USA, if you know, I, I'm, I'm available. But pomegranate molasses, you know, tangy, sweet, sharp, um, the boiled, well, the condensed down juice of, of pom fresh pomegranate juice, um, an essential component of so many Turkish dishes. So get yourself a bottle of that. Get yourself a packet of Aleppo pepper, or to use the Turkish name, pulbeber, which is this kind of fruity um, red pepper flake. So it doesn't have a huge amount of heat, but just adds a lovely uh, fragrance to dishes. You want to get yourself some sumac because again we want the astringency in those incredible kebabs and salads that you're going to be making and then i think the others are more familiar but you know you definitely want some good oregano and actually if you can source greek oregano with some things i'm quite specific i'm like get you know some things from certain countries you know the greeks do fantastic you know um, oregano and thyme and then probably just a bit of paprika and you're sorted um, I did, you know, the sumac for me in particular was a uh, revelation. I made everyone in my family just kind of take a thimble full of it and taste it because it's this like citric and sunny yeah. dried herb. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, 
And anytime I, you want to add a bit of astringency to a dish, like instead of lemon or an addition, you can add that and it, it gives you that sharpness without, yeah, the liquid. I, I don't mean to, you know, make you stand for, you know, your, your people, but I did have some Persians slide into my DM when I posted a picture of a Lebanese pomegranate molasses. And they said, why are you getting the Arab stuff? What's going on there? I mean, you know, you don't have to defend that comment, but is is there a difference uh, from place to place? There, I mean, there really is. And, you know, I would say that at least it was Lebanese and not Turkish. Um, <laughs> okay. just, uh, no. If you want to really start a fight on yeah, Instagram. Yeah. And the only reason I say that is because a lot of Turkish pomegranate molasses has got sugar in it. So you just want to check your bottle. I think the Lebanese pomegranate molasses is very astringent. So it's probably quite sharp. I always buy Persian, but you know, each to their own. Yeah. Um, I think there are certain things. Um, I'm just trying to think what else is a good one. It's like tahini. Mm. Don't buy tahini from the three countries in my book, buy it from Lebanon. Like Lebanese tahini, that is what, you know, I think like Osalengi and Sami Tamimi go on about that as well. It's the best one. So just within the region, there are, yeah, some places just do things better maybe. Um, and, you know, the, the great thing with this book uh, also is you you can experiment if you, you know, yeah. you feel you owe your Persian buddies, uh, you know, a, a, a second version of that dish. It's it's out there to be had. Um, well, we have a couple more minutes before I want to get to uh, questions and answers from uh, mm -hmm. you lovely people in the audience. If you've got a question, uh, put it up there. You can um, just slide at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you do a mouse over, you can see the Q&A button. Uh, we've got a few questions in there, but I would love to have some more um, to, to get through. Um, I would like to, you know, I, I guess, what's that now? I said good questions. I just oh yeah, they're working on them. All right. Well, we're, okay. We got, we got, we got a positive, but let's see if we can get even better for <laughs> the next few minutes. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you uh, also just in terms of this cuisine in the United States context, you have uh, a lot of time here. This is the U.S. book launch. Uh, this is the official day today, which is uh, great news for us here. Um, if if you had to, I don't know, give me give me three dishes that will. <laughs> I know I'm I'm putting you on the spot here, but three dishes that will kind of say something foundational uh, about the cuisine here, and and uh, that would give people the very the very quickest kind of uh, building blocks. Great. Okay, I'm going to start with a pomegranate and sumac chicken. Um, gorgeous marinated um, chicken legs, or you can just join a whole bird and do it as well. Um, this is flavored with that trinity I spoke of, the pomegranate molasses, the sumac, the pulver bear, um, a bit of allspice. And it is a recipe that is inspired by my time in Lesvos, Greece, but inspired by a Syrian doctor who set up a restaurant there. And it was one of the dishes I ate at his restaurant. So give that a go. It's one of the best recipes. Well, it's just you know, who doesn't like roasted chicken? It's easy. And the second one is I'm going to go just because, you know, we should be experimenting. So let's go for the hot yogurt soup. Um, a, a very common in, in Turkic kind of cultures and countries, because obviously not just Turkey, but further east. Um, and it's just made with, you know, full fat yogurt, um, some rice, chicken broth and flavored with lots of mint and then a pulver bear, Aleppo pepper spike and butter spiked kind of chili butter thing on top. Classic, really great dish. Again, ready in like 30 minutes. You will thank me after you make it. Uh, so we've got the soup, we've got some chicken. Um, and then, oh God, there's so much. What should I go for? Okay, um, I think... Yeah, well, you know, let's go for the halloumi and figs. So halloumi saganaki, uh, a Greek dish, but uh, the version or the bit, the, you know, the recipe that I've got there is inspired by a recipe that I, well, a dish I kept going back to at this restaurant in Nicosia, which is the capital of Cyprus. Um, so, I mean, this is just one of my favorite I mean, appetizers, I mean, fried cheese, you can't really go wrong with it. So you kind of dip the halloumi in some semolina. It's, it's then dressed with some honey, which is very typical of the region, with some thyme as well. Nestle a few ripe figs in there. It's like you're in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's all I want. 
<laughs> By the way, this is a very clear ploy. I'm just menu planning for later tonight. So, <laughs> all right, time to stick that bowl out the window and get some of that halloumi to come back to me. Oh, um, yeah. And I was going to give you another recipe, but it's enough. There's just... No, no, come on. I'm, I'm, I I'm mean, ready. I just had it earlier. I do cook my own recipes sometimes. Um, <laughs> the Turkish bride soup. It's just like another classic Turkish soup. They often have it for like, they often have soups for breakfast in Turkey. It's supposed mm. to be a great hangover cure, this one. But um, yeah, it's just a really classic lentil soup with bulgur wheat. Um, again, lots of paprika, lots of mint, dried mint in this. Um, yeah, dried mint. I missed that out on the ingredients list earlier. Mm. Everyone should get that. Dried um, mint. Dried mint. It's completely uh, different to fresh mint and has a different impact on dishes. All right, I knew I knew I was, but this is, is this spearmint? No, this is. Could be spearmint, could be peppermint. Either either one. All right, yeah. I'm gonna have to run back out. Yeah, uh, go back to the store. Then you can make that soup. Starting, uh, starting off the questions is not a question, but a pantry recommendation. I'm just gonna put that out there. Catherine, thank you. She says in NYC and areas with fairway grocery stores, Mediterranean or oregano there is wonderful. I mean, yeah. I, it's it's in New York, you're most likely to find, especially bulk and, and good like Mexican oregano, but it's just a different flavor. Um, so if you've got if you've got the chance, uh, go out and, and get that 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 good Greek stuff. Um, all right. Should we start with Francois? He seems to be wanting to start a bit of a fight in the comments. Uh, I did see that. I can't believe you went there. I was just like, okay. Oh, Francois, let's start some shit here. He says, my Egyptian friend said the Greeks and Turks did not invent food things, which is so nonspecific and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet provocative. Uh, but uh, he, he does have a question that I, I, I like here because I think of you also, uh, speaking of these trinities, I think of you as the author now of three books that have you know, similar shape in some ways. So again, that's, uh, and by the way, they make uh, beautiful companions on the bookshelf. If I you- I held it up yet. I feel like no one's held up the book. So I'm um, yeah, you've Don't seen our- We'll just hold it. <laughs> this this yeah. is our new stars. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, there's this book, but there's also uh, Zaytun about the, the food of Palestine and, and then Saffron Tales from Iran. Uh, I get those books and I'm just going to show them for people who don't know. I'm going to give them uh, I yes, I recommend them all. And uh, like I said, they they work wonderfully. I mean, just beautiful covers. Come on, people get get uh, get all three. But it's a good question that Francois raises here, not necessarily about the Greeks and Turks, but how uh, how could you highlight the differences between these three books i mean what 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 for you do you have a an arc in your mind of of what makes them unique from each other uh yeah that's so interesting i just speed read the question and so i didn't realize that was a question i thought it was like what are the three differences between the greeks and the turks um, <laughs> i was just like okay. man why would i answer that <laughs> i have i have got answers but like that isn't uh, right. um so the difference between the books, uh, really interesting. So, huh, because they are quite different, even though they're similar. I'm just going to stare at them for a moment. Okay, so I think Saffron is, um, I personally think Saffron is political because it you cannot write a book about Iran, I think, without being political, but it's probably like the least overtly. So, you know, I don't talk about sanctions. I don't talk about the regime, what I try and do is what I feel is completely missing in certainly the, the US narrative, but also here is celebrate the art, the culture, the history, the agriculture, really it, it just makes such a huge effort in that book to just make, celebrate the beauty that I grew up with in Iran. Um, and it, um, I mean, it's interesting. I think actually they're all very personal. So, but yeah, I would say that that's that. I think that Zaytun, um, oh, what can I say? I think um, Zaytun offers, I think the food in Zaytun uh, is probably the most vegetable based. So that also just reflects the, cult the culture of the region and the food of the region. And then I think that the stories in it um, are probably the ones that, um, I mean, not that the stories in Right Figs aren't deeply reported, but, you know, I was, I was, you know, 
Israel Palestine was my beat when I was an NGO worker. So, you know, I'm quoting UN resolutions in there. It's just, it's, it's, it's got, I feel like it's a good snapshot. It goes of, down smooth though. It, it yeah, doesn't, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a fun yeah. read uh, despite It is, that. it is, yeah. it really is. Um, but yeah, I feel that, that, and then, oh, I don't know, right fit. I feel like I'm not answering this question properly, but, um, I think obviously right fig stands out or what makes it different is that it's not looking at a specific country it's just zooming out and looking at a region um so yeah but um yeah I, I i did feel that way about uh zaytun which is you know uh very vegetable friendly i i love as as someone who's a uh, propagandist for omnivorism. I loved some of the meat moments in Ripe Figs, uh, particularly how you went to a Greek island and I think the guy said, told you something like, you know, here in Icaria, uh, you know, goat is our fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, that's kind of an upgrade for me. So I'm, I'm, I'm right there with him. Uh, there are some very, very good uh, meat dishes in here. Uh, but always accented with these uh, this sort of trinity of herbs um, and the uh, and more that you've got in there. So um, beautiful. We have uh, a few Cypriots on the line. Hey, Let's see you guys. Uh, one uh, one of our commenters traces uh, themselves back to Nicosia. Another has family on the Greek Cypriot side. Uh, so one of the questions is, what is your favorite restaurants if you have any in Nicosia? Or Nicosia. Oh. I, don't even, I don't even know how to pronounce that. Nicosia. Thank you. Um, well, um, I can find the name of it, but there's um, there is one restaurant that I just, there's so many great restaurants there. I think it's called Loxandra or something. It's in the book under the, um, the halloumi and, and fig recipe, um, the, 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 the salad. And, it, and it's just on the main street. And it's just, oh God, you know, it's one of those places where... Um, <laughs> That, that, that we, we always got the same waitress when we went back and she was always like incredibly rude in that, you know, and sometimes you're in an establishment and you like almost know the food is going to be good because they can afford to be so rude to you when they're like, when you're like taking time to be on the menu. But um, yeah, it's just one of those classic things where you're kind of, as well as the food being great, it was just that thing of sitting out on a balmy Mediterranean evening, overlooking a square, the, the hustle and bustle of people, God, I can't even imagine that anymore. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Luxandra, I feel it's, that, it's in the book. Yeah, you are getting some high fives about Luxandra uh, in the oh, comments. Great. I think I think that is yes, I got the name right. Great. Uh, Ab Abigail uh, Riley has asked, as uh, someone who has family on the Greek Cypriot side, if you had a uh, peaceful moment or two there, like, um, are we looking for yeah? A, a, a moment where it's not just a woman storming off and saying, I'm not eating their food on the other side of the border. Uh, did you find any any hopeful uh, moments while you were out there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd never been to Cyprus before researching this book and I just enjoyed my trips there so much. It's such a beautiful island. Um, oh, just so many great moments. So I think that two things really stand out. One is um, there's this great, I mean, I love places where people come together. So there is this cafe called Home for Cooperation, which is situated exactly in the no man's land in the green, green line, in the greens, what's, what's it called? Anyway, in that in that space, you know, and it's a place where, um, yeah, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots get together, they organize, they run workshops, they eat food. Um, and when you go in like the library, when I was going around the library, I mean, they had like books from like the Northern Irish peace process from like South Africa. So, you know, everyone was like doing the work, trying to work out how to bring people together. And yeah, it was just such an inspiring space. Um, and then, yeah, I did quite a lot of cooking with grandmas there, which is always fun. You know, I learned kind of how to make halloumi from a Greek Cypriot grandma in the south. And I learned how to make, you know, rolled, you know, stuffed grape leaves from a Turkish Cypriot grandma in the north. And again, their stories were so similar because, you know, they grew up at a time where Greeks and Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots, I mean, they just were Cypriots, you know, living on the mm. same street in the same neighborhood. So just hearing the parallels and the similarities between their stories and how frustrated they were that in their lifetime, their island had been divided when in their mind, there was no division. So yeah, it was really lots of really inspiring experiences. Um, yeah, it's the opposite of what the Germans, what do they call it? The wall in the mind. It's like yeah. people are actually 
tearing the wall down in their mind yeah. at the, or yeah. pretending it's it's not there. Um, we have a question from uh, Meredith Jones. Once it is safe to travel again internationally, where do you recommend going? Where do I recommend going? Oh. Or uh, let's put it this way, for yourself personally, where do you dream of going? You've got a wide palette, wide canvas to choose from. Wild palette. Well, I'm not just saying this because I know my sister's on the call, but um, I'm very much looking forward to coming to New York my, and seeing my sister and my nephew. My sister had a baby during the pandemic. And it's, you know, it's, as we all know, it's just hard to be away from family. So I'd love to, that is probably my first destination as soon as we can, because there is a baby in New York who needs my cuddles. <laughs> um, uh. That doesn't help me at all, though. I'm you want to come here, here huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, yeah. So, so that's definitely true. Right. But in terms of my own culinary adventures, you know, I was. I mean, it's hard because it's not just because I've written this book, or maybe I'm just touring the book so much that I'm just like desperate to get to an island <laughs> in the Mediterranean. Like all I'm doing every day is being like, imagine turquoise shimmering waters and, you know, beautiful islands. But I definitely love to go back to the Med and, you know, further afield from that, I've never been to Vietnam and I feel that Asia, I've traveled around a lot of East Asia and for some reason I've not made it there yet. So got a lot uh -huh. of get to Ter terrible food you would totally regret the experience <laughs> <laughs> vietnam noted for having uh yeah no vietnam will absolutely shake your tree it's a uh yeah. that, that that is a good destination i'm flying to tbilisi tomorrow from new york so, i know as, as, which we had talked about so meredith uh depending on your vaccination schedule and your general recklessness <laughs> i guess uh maybe it's safe again tomorrow to travel uh uh, we'll find out about it. But, you know, it is, you know, speaking of the wall in your mind, I think this is a question for all of us. It's like how, you know, even even when we feel personally safe, like how are we going to get out there? How are we going to feel good about doing it? Um, yeah, it's a that hard one, isn't it? Like, who knows what's going to be possible, even if stuff is possible, who knows what we should do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, I mean, this just gets us into a whole other subject, which I'm sure we don't want to get into. But um, as a travel writer, it is something I think about because, um, you know, it's going to take a hell of a lot of time for many countries in the global south to get vaccinated, you know, like mm -hmm. a long time. Unless, yeah. you know, and that is, I think, you know, we already have a lot of inequality in the world. And, and I think the vaccine inequality is, 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 is wow, it's going to play out in, and it already is playing out. And... Yeah, I don't know what that means for, for us, because obviously, yeah, a lot of countries also depend on tourism. It, who knows? It, you know, so many so many things to be concerned about. You know, we should all be giving to the Washington Literacy Center. Uh, and there's so many great causes, but it feels like something to really take to the streets uh, about right now, particularly in the context of talking a book about migration is, is this vaccine inequality, because listen, that's something you can do, not just for somebody else. That's, that's for all of us. Like we're really not getting out of this until our leaders can start shipping vaccine tomorrow. So, um, I've got a question from Karen O'Brown. I'm going to say this, don't blush, but she says she's very touched by your writing and humanity. Me too, Karen. Uh, thank you for what you bring awareness uh, to awareness and sensitivity of the movement around the world and contributing conditions. Are you able to stay in touch with some of the people you've met in the camps and are cooked with? Thank you again. And I can imagine that would be incredibly difficult. As a journalist, I had a the hardest time staying in touch with the people who were in the most dire situations and uh, circumstances for, for those reasons. But what about you? Do you, do you, have you been able to uh, maintain connection to either the organizations or the people? Yeah, it's a good question. So I have, you know, some positive stories. So Mojde, who is an Afghan Iranian woman who I talk about, I spend time with her in Lesbos. Um, you know, she, we, we kind of connected on Instagram uh you know while we were there and she's i'm happy to report in germany now she kind of got off the island quite soon is kind of setting up a life there is, is in education um but no i mean i you know i having worked again roughly in this sector for a long time you know definitely when i was an ngo worker you 
you spend a lot of time kind of in the field, interviewing people, talking to people. I found that for me, there's actually a fine balance between sometimes choosing to keep in touch with people and then sometimes being like, you know, I can't carry, you know, this isn't, you know, I, my, my job is to, to, to be here and be present and then to share this. And yeah, I try to not get into too many personal, you know, with Monjda, I just really connected with her and I wanted to know she was okay and I wanted to try and help her. But yeah, I think impo it's important just for your, uh, well, for me anyway, to keep that distance. So yeah, um, yeah. That, it, uh, it, it, it can be a lot. Um, and you've got more books and more stories to tell. Uh, here's a question about that act of writing. Uh, from Rosabel Guzman. As a travel writer, what do you try to avoid when writing about a destination or topic? And, you know, I feel like my answer for you, Jasmine, would be very long because there's a lot of ways to do it poorly and you don't do any of them. But, uh, but what, is your, what is your list of things to avoid uh, in travel writing writ large? Yeah. Um, it's a good question, isn't it? Like, what, what, do, what are the things that... Um... What are the, I don't know if I even do them consciously, but I must do, I guess, to some extent. Um, okay, so there's really obvious ones, you know, I, I, I try not in my writing to talk about kind of discovering anything or, you know, you know, it's very much about me being a passive observer or someone who's learning or who is, you know, I think a lot of that, you get that a lot in kind of when chefs go off and I like, discovered this great dish and it's like, you really, you really didn't. So. <laughs> I guess that's more on the food side. Um, I don't, I know this sounds a strange thing to say, but like I try not to present myself as an authoritative voice on a topic, even though on many of these topics, I think I am very knowledgeable because I think as soon as you just step away and are like, hey, I'm just an ordinary person traveling through and here's what I'm observing. And I'm just gonna tell you everything that I observe, whether it's good or bad, it frees you up a little bit. Still not answering your question, though, is it? What What are the what, what? Why don't you tell me? Like, what are the things that you think really make travel writing bad? I mean, I, it's it all comes down to this colonial mindset. So I think yeah. you've already touched on it. You know, that sense that you, as the writer, are always in a pith helmet. You know, entering the clearing in the jungle and half discovered something um, never before. And and I think you know, as you had said. Starting from the very beginning, this is this is this is your background, your heritage, which uh, is is uh, mixed heritage and from places that uh, were were not treated well by the pith helmet crowd. And I feel like this this is part of you know part of what you bring to it uh, very instinctually to the point where you probably can't even recognize it. Yeah. You're doing it but it's that but it's, yeah. You've made me think now, but yeah, definitely. I make a point, and when I read other writers who sometimes write about the Middle East, it kind of sometimes makes me cringe. I really, when I describe people, I really try not to describe them in a way that is demeaning in terms of like how they look or their experience. Like I think that gets done a lot, this kind of like poverty porn we used to say when I used to work for NGO, like, okay, how can, I try not to, even if some of the circumstances I'm visiting are pretty graphic or pretty terrible like I try not to talk about them in that way because it's just dehumanizing and degrading and like that isn't my exchange with someone and I really hate that when I when I when I read it as well because it's like why are you putting that extra color in like what yeah. is it saying other than this poor person that you're trying to stereo oh I don't know I don't like it yeah yeah, I mean, and, and just that recognition that uh, we in our comfort are only one fire festival away from being <laughs> you know, in, in exactly the same spot. Um, so, wow, that sounds like a very strange but lovely place, uh, <laughs> to leave this conversation. Our hour is up. Your many, uh, many lovely hours with Yasmin's books, uh, including and especially Ripe Figs, uh, are just beginning. Uh, lucky you. So. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Claire, but I just want to say personally, uh, thank you, Chef Costa. Thank you to Claire and Beth at Politics and Prose. And thank you so much, Yasmin, for being who you are and for having the, uh, the fortitude to always bring it so beautifully to the page. I'm proud to know you. Thank you. Thanks so much for yeah doing this too. It's been a real pleasure. Well, I would like to extend a big thank you to our speakers tonight and Chef Costa of Zetinia for joining us at the top of the hour and for the lovely meal. And thank you all for coming. Your patronage is what enables us to bring you programming like this. And we cannot continue to host events like these without the book sales to support them. 
please support Yasmin Khan and Politics and Prose by using the link in the chat to purchase Ripe Figs, Recipes and Stories from Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. And while you're in the chat, please consider making a donation to the Washington Liberal <laughs> our co-sponsor tonight. You can visit our website for the most up-to-date event listings. We do hope to see you at another event soon. Stay well-read, everyone. Stay well-fed, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>